We're going to talk today about um, um, about the next thing Jesus does when he after he enters into Jerusalem, and I just want to let you know that it's uh, it's not great. We live in a culture that comes to church so we can feel good about ourselves. Can we say amen to that? I'm going to come to church and feel good and have a and have like a you know, kumbaya moment and like, oh, we're all just, this is awesome. And then every now and then you get into the Bible and they're like, it's not awesome. And so the Passion Week, Jesus, as we talked about last week, comes in kind of in a parade. And, and then the first thing he does is goes into the temple. We're going to talk about that this morning. And try to try to discern where we fit. How do we take that message and apply it to our lives? How do, we, how do we make sure that we understand what Jesus was doing that day? And so we're gonna, we're gonna lean into this this morning. Um, we're about four or five weeks out from Easter and, um, and Jesus is clearing the temple. So if I, if I put a name on this, I would just call it judgment. Yeah. Judgment. Because that's what he was doing. Hey, can I, can I just give you a hint? Judgment is not bad. We do live in a culture that's trying to, try to eradicate all forms of judgment. All, all forms of it. In other words, you can't, you can't take a test and have somebody judge whether you did accurate on the test or not. Everybody hear what I'm saying? Nobody hasn't, nobody can have like, that's not right. Oh, you can't say it's not right. But we are called biblically to judge ourselves and judge fruit. The Bible tells us that we'll know each other, we'll know them by their fruits, by what our lives produce. And so there inherently has to be a judgment to be able to say, well, that is godly fruit or it's ungodly fruit. Amen? Amen? Because some things you pick off the tree, you eat. Some things you shouldn't eat. And, and we have to be able to do this. And where it starts is with us in the church. So we're going to lean into that. Mark chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 11. Mark 11, 11. Why don't you stand to your feet one more time in honor of reading the word. And we're going to kick this off. Mark 11, 11. Say Amen if you still want to hear it. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he look, had looked around at everything, as it was late already, he went out to Bethany with the 12. On the following day, when he came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? but you made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, if I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe and you will receive it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Father, we thank you this morning. 
Lord, we pray that we'd be able to see ourselves this morning clearly. We, we pray that conviction would rest on us. We pray that today we'd become more like you. Put your finger on it today, Lord, whatever it is. And I pray that we'd respond well to you. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. I'll be honest with you, this seems like a strange conversation. Jesus enters into Jerusalem, as we talked about last week, enters into Jerusalem. By the time he gets into the temple, uh, the, the crowds, the, all the crowds seem to have dispersed. Isn't it, isn't it crazy that there was this big procession that led him into Jerusalem, and then as soon as he gets inside, they're all like, yeah, okay. There's really no indication that anybody kind of stuck around him and and was like, yeah, we're so excited. They just kind of all dispersed and went and did their thing. Jesus makes his way up into the temple, and, and Mark just says that he gets up, he goes into the temple court, and he looks around. No indication that anything's wrong at this point in time. He just looks around. He goes back out to Bethany. That's where we believe Jesus was staying. He wasn't staying in Jerusalem. He's going back out to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And staying, if you remember Lazarus, he raised Lazarus from the dead. That's a cool guy to hang out with, you know what I mean? So he's, he's making this little journey back and forth every day, back from, from, the, from inside the city to back out to Bethany. Maybe you call it a safe house. Because what we'll find out is today, on this day when he goes into the temple, that they're plotting now. So when he leaves that evening, he goes out and he um, sees a fig tree. Or no, he's coming back. He's coming back into Jerusalem. He sees a fig tree with nothing on it. Now leaves. And this is a, this is a thing that we, you got to do a little bit of digging to find out. Because Mark specifically says that a fig tree had no leaves, or had leaves on it, but nothing else, all right? But then he says it wasn't time for figs. And if you just read it like that, you go, why would Jesus curse a fig tree when it wasn't even time to have figs on it? That sounds just mean, doesn't it? And in our sensitive culture today, could you imagine? Jesus hurt the little fig tree. And we'd have a whole organization, a nonprofit established just to save fig trees because Jesus cursed the fig tree. We'll get back to that in a second. He curses the fig tree. The, 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 Mark says that the disciples hear him do it. They hear him. They get into Jerusalem. He walks into the temple after having scoped it out the night before. It's important to know where he walks into. He walks into what's called the, the court of the Gentiles, the Gentile court. What that means is anyone who wasn't Jewish, this is the area they worshiped in. Even back, even back before Jesus died on the cross and resurrected, the plan of God was to include the nations in worship to him. And so in the construction of the temple, there was a court where Gentiles, non-Jewish, people of the whole world could come in and worship. So he enters into that court. Well, what he knows now is that that whole court has been in, turned into a bazaar, like, like this trading post. During the Passover, thousands and thousands of animals would be brought into Jerusalem to sacrifice. And people are traveling. So you know there's a few entrepreneurs around. So out on their way in from the Mount of Olives, if you do some research, you find out that some very smart entrepreneurs had set up stands where they could, where they could purchase animals instead of bringing them with them. Doesn't this sound amazing? No? I think it sounds awesome. 
So people could stop and purchase a pigeon or a dove or a lamb or whatever they needed for the sacrifice instead of dragging it all the way on the journey. Now, what the Jewish leaders and rulers understood was there was income going out before they got in. So why don't we make it possible to buy and sell that stuff right here? That's an awesome thing. We should put a kiosk in the church where you could get your car registration renewed. That sounds amazing. File your taxes right here in the church. No. Sounds absurd, doesn't it? This is what had started happening in the court of the Gentiles. They had pushed all the worship out. There was even, you had to, when you gave your temple tax, you had to give it in a certain, a certain type of coin. You couldn't give it in the Roman in the Roman issued money. So you had to exchange it. So all this, think about it, all this commerce going in to what was supposed to be the worship area for Gentiles. It was supposed to be the worship area for all non-Jewish people. So the place where worship is supposed to be happening, the place especially now during the Passover celebration, the place where worship is supposed to be happening, it just smells like animal stuff and and people are everywhere buying and selling. And to beat it all, the Jewish leaders are taking advantage of people. Because the exchange rate in the temple is not what you can get out. They're taking advantage of people. They had actually turned that area also into a shortcut. Could you imagine? Think about this. Think about if during the service right now, if people that lived on that side of the church were just walking through to get to Route 9. Imagine where, where worship and, and all these things are supposed to be taking place. Imagine there's people everywhere, animals, money changers, people just with, with all their goods and, and stuff they were carrying on their journey just walking through. Jesus walks in that evening and sees it all. He sees it all, and you can imagine the hurt in him. He comes back that morning. And I guess you could say he handled business. The Bible says that he goes in there, and he flips over the money changers' tables. Now picture this. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus was really muscular or any, 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 anything to look at. He's just a normal-looking guy, furious now, flipping over tables. So you can imagine money, coins flying everywhere. The people that are in charge of down on their hands and knees trying to, like, what is he doing? He's, they're trying to scrape up all the money. Everybody's scattering. He himself is trying to stop people from walking through this area. And he's telling everybody, you know this is supposed to be a house of prayer. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. My house will be a house of prayer for the nations. And then he says, but you've turned it in, he quotes Jeremiah, you've turned it into a den of robbers. Now the crazy part is this. He then walks out of the temple and there is no indication that anybody changed anything. They just picked up all their stuff. No other gospel writer tells us that they all started to repent and cleared out the court of the Gentiles and allowed Gentile worship to happen there. No, there's no indication of it. It's just like the maniac came in, flipped over the table, started screaming, and then when he left, everybody went, oh, that was crazy. Matter of fact, the exact opposite happened. The, ex the, the leaders right then started plotting. He's not going to come in and mess with the way we're doing this. He's not going to come in and mess up our system that we are benefiting from. Hmm. It's a dangerous place to be, you know that? We're going to get to that in a second. 
on his way back. On his way back, Peter realizes, sees, sees the fruit on the tree. No fruit, no leaves, no nothing. It's withered now. And he asked about it. And Jesus starts teaching them. Now remember, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it had full of leaves, no figs. When they're coming back now, now it's withered all the way to the root. Peter stops and says, hey, man, that's crazy. That thing just a little while ago had full of leaves. Now we heard you curse it. And they're, they're, they can't put it all together. Like, what's, why are you cursing fig trees and flipping over tables? It just seems a little scatterbrained, Jesus. I mean, we just walked in on a parade last night. What's going on? Jesus starts to teach them about prayer, which seems displaced, about forgiveness, which seems displaced on the surface. It's like, I don't know how this fits together. But Mark, the gospel writer Mark, puts it all together. So we're going to lean into it. Are you ready? The issue at hand with the fig tree is something I call potential fruit. Potential fruit. Anybody ever see potential in somebody? You know what that means, right? It's not there yet, but there's signs of it. Maybe, maybe you just dedicated, maybe your family just dedicated your kid this morning, and you're like, oh, our kid is definitely smarter than all of the other ones up here. We see the potential. Now, you don't really know if your kid's smarter yet, because they haven't taken any test. They haven't, we haven't tested them yet. But, but you're seeing the potential is there. And so, so we're waiting on the season to come where they're old enough to teach them how to tie their shoes. And they're old enough to walk and they're old enough to talk and they're old enough to start reading and they're old enough to start back talk and they're old enough to all these things. They're old enough to lie now and The potential is there. (laughs) So potential is like something that you see could happen, but not not yet. Not yet. Um, I remember growing up playing basketball at the Boys and Girls Club in Martinsburg and thinking, I got some potential. (laughs) Jesus looks at the fig tree full of leaves and no figs, and Mark specifically says it's not the season for figs. And you go, why would he curse a tree for not having fruit when it's not supposed to have fruit yet? Ah, but here comes the anatomy of a fig tree. Did you know that fig trees actually produce a little teeny thing that comes up before the fruit happens and it actually falls off of the tree and they would eat that even. And it was like a little berry and it came on and fell off and it was an indication that it would have figs later. Uh, Now you following me? So now Jesus is looking at the fig tree and he's not saying this fig tree's cursed because there's no figs on it. He said, he said it's, I'm cursing it because there's no potential for figs. Potential fruit. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Did you hear that statement? Nothing but leaves. There wasn't this little berry on it. That in that season, no figs, but it was the potential should have been there. The potential should have been there. He said to it, may no one ever eat of your fruit fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Jesus was using the fig tree as an illustration of, of what Israel had become. Full of leaves but no sign of fruit, 
full of leaves but no sign of fruit. So he walks into the temple. Now put this together. He looks at a tree, curses it because there's leaves on it, but no fruit, no potential fruit. Then he walks into the temple. It's the Passover week, the celebration. The whole place is bustling. There's leaves on the tree. But then when he walks into the temple, he says, there's no potential for fruit here. You've turned what should have been for worship into nothing. You've taken all the potential away. The fig tree at that time should have had some indication at that time of year that good fruit was coming, but there was nothing. And the same thing happened in the temple. The circumstance Jesus finds is not only killing Gentile worship, but there's not even an attitude of repentance towards Jesus. So watch this. The one area that Gentiles could come in and worship and express that to God, the Jews had taken all of the potential out of it. There was no opportunity for it. There were people everywhere, but no worship. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, listen, this is what it, pay attention to what this looks like. There's a fig tree with no potential on it. Now we're going to walk up into the temple and look what this was supposed to be. This was supposed to be where the nations come and glorify God. And now, guess what? Zero potential for that to happen. Zero potential. You know what? Uh, I remember as a parent, the most frustrating thing ever was to, was to know deep down that your kids had potential and see them make a decision that may not be leading them toward that. That's devastating as a parent. No, my parents never had that trouble with me. <laughs> What's that old country song? You've been losing sleep since 1993. 1976. Can I challenge you this morning? Coming to church is not a bad thing. Just checking. Just checking. Coming to church isn't a bad thing. Being around Christian people is not a bad thing. But sometimes that stuff is leaves on the tree. Does that make sense? Sometimes that stuff is leaves on the tree because we can come to church on Sunday morning and sit in a chair full of unforgiveness. I'm skipping ahead, but bear with me. We can come and sit and all the, if we're not careful, all the potential could be gone. For all intent and purposes, the Passover week, the temple was operating. Jerusalem was full of people. It looked like from the outside, it looked like that the thing was just happening. Look at all this stuff happening. It is glorious. It's the way God set it up. And then the Son of God walks in and says, this is nothing like we intended. This does not look like what we wanted it to look like. Matter of fact, it looks like a fig tree that has all the leaves but will never produce anything. It will never produce anything. And he walks into the court of the Gentiles and finds that same exact thing. There's leaves on this tree, but it will be fruitless. You say, Chris, that's a hard word. Are you telling me I could be fruitless? Here's what I'm telling you. If you have the same response as the Jewish leaders, yes. I would like to think, Pastor Don's my pastor. He's, he's here this morning. I would like to think if he walked in my house and flipped over the kitchen table, which would be totally out of character for him. <laughs> if he walked in my house and flipped over the kitchen table and said, hey, Buster, we got to talk, that I would sit there and go, yes, sir. Could I first ask why you flipped the table over? <laughs> my wife was kind of fond of that. I would think, this must be serious. I must have done something. I need to listen. Are you following me? 
Jesus walks into his house, flips the tables over, and everybody goes, what's he think he's doing? What's he think he's doing? Matter of fact, not only what does he think he's doing, let's get him. Church, the most fruitless place we could be is a place where we can't repent. I'm not even talking about corporate. I'm talking about when God puts his finger on something in my life and when he puts his finger on something in your life and we go, how dare you? Like repentance is the key to fruit. Repentance is the key to going, God, use me. Use me. Change something in my life. You put your finger on it, Lord. You put your, you flip the table over. I'm listening. I'm listening. You, you, you got my attention now. All my stuff is all over the floor. You got my attention. And now I want to do this the right way. But the Jewish leaders couldn't, couldn't even imagine doing it the right way. So Jesus is teaching the disciples, listen, just because there's leaves all over the tree, just because everybody's getting together, just because they claim to be in my name, does not mean there's fruit being born out of that. It's a danger for the church in America. So I'm going to ask you this morning, when confronted, can you repent? I know that's a tough question at 9.30 in the morning. When you got an hour less sleep. But it's the critical one for us to bear fruit. Do we find ourselves being calloused to the conviction of the Holy Spirit? When's the last time we felt shame over something? Think about it. Do we argue with the truth? All these are signs that the potential for fruit is missing. Now listen. Now listen. I need you to understand something. God is not going, hey, you're fruitless. I'm going to just burn you up. God knows the potential in you also knows that it's pivotal, that it's hinging on our ability to go, God, I need your forgiveness through Christ, and I need you to, I need you to change me. I'm going to walk away from what I was doing, and I'm going to embrace your plan for my life. Amen? So he has these he has these temple moments with us where he walks into our lives, and he shakes things up, and he says, you can't keep going down this road. If Jesus didn't care about the Jewish people, he would have stayed out of the temple and told the, and told the disciples, watch how I tear this place down. But he gave them the grace of walking in and saying, you can't do it like this anymore. There's no fruit here. There's no potential for fruit here. And he walks into our lives day after day after day. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's your conscience. It's when you wake up in the morning and go, I shouldn't have done that. And the more we put it off, the more we put it off, the more we put it off, the more we go, oh, it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that bad. I can, you know, nobody's going to find out. I could just, as more we put it off, the more callous we become to it. And Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders had become so callous that when the God of all the universe, the creator of all the universe, walks into his own temple and flips the tables over and says, this should not be. They look around, wait for him to leave, and clean it all up and start over. And I, for one, pray to God that the church wouldn't be like that. That Jesus himself could walk in and convict us of sin and righteousness. And then when he leaves, we just pick it all right back up. The potential for fruit is so great in this room. It's so great with the church in Berkeley Springs. It's so great with the church online. The potential is so great, but the potential is only recognized in repentance. Amen? The second thing, it's not just local fruit. I know there's some of you foodies in here that only like eating local stuff. You're great. Well, every now and then I want a banana. Oh, you didn't think about that, did you? I never rode through Back Creek Valley and found a banana tree 
anywhere. So you could do all your local stuff. If you're going to eat a banana, it's by definition from somewhere else. I'm not saying local's bad. I like local stuff. I like knowing where my meat comes from. I like knowing where my corn comes from. I like knowing those things. That's all good and dandy. The problem is when God wants to include people in our lives that we don't like. (laughs) You know what would have been so much easier for the Jews if he just didn't put the court of the Gentiles in there? It would have been easy. But he messed it all up by inviting the outsiders in. He messed it all up by giving them, giving them a space. He messed it all up by Isaiah saying it will be a house of prayer for the nations. He messed it all up because we're God's chosen people. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the Israelites? We're God's chosen people, proud of being God's chosen people. He chose us. And then he built the temple and made us make space for other people. When the gospel writers write the story of Jesus, you see him engaging with people who are not Jewish. And it infuriates them. But that was his plan. He told them, this isn't just about about local fruit. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. I'm going to show you how this happens when he dies. This is at the... Crucifixion of Jesus, Matthew 27, verse 50. Now remember, the temple had an inner court, an inner place where there was a veil and only the high priests were able to go behind the veil. No one, it didn't matter if you were Jewish or not. There's only specific people that could ever go behind that, that veil. It was, it was holy, the holiest place there. So we have these progressions of access. The Gentiles were all the way out on the outside in the, in the Gentile court, and the Jewish people could go in farther. And then there was a, then the Holy of Holies was restricted. But when Jesus is on the cross and he dies, Matthew records it this way, verse 20, chapter 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. So picture this. Jesus dies. There's a giant earthquake. The earth shakes. Rocks split open. And the temple, the curtain that's separated, splits all the way down the middle. There's a giant heavy curtain. Splits all the way down the middle. That was God saying, now I want all y'all to worship together. I think he said it like that. All y'all. Everybody now has access through the death of Christ. Everybody now has access through the death of Christ. Everybody. Paul would later on write in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus was at this point in time in the temple pronouncing judgment over the whole nation. You've had every opportunity, every resource, and you turned what I gave you into something fruitless. They literally had the opportunity to reach the nations and have them worship the one true God, but they turned it into a mall. They turned it into a mall. And he's saying, you had all this potential opportunity to reach people outside that aren't Jewish. I created a space for them, and you turned it into a shopping plaza. The temple was designed to reach the nations, but they had only focused on themselves, making it impossible for the nations to worship. The temple had become a place of political power and military hope, but not a place of worship for all people. So I'm going to ask you this morning. I love the fact that we support missionaries all over the world. I love the fact that Laura Lusher's passion is to, is to take you and let you go see all over the world what God is doing. That's an important thing, amen? I think we gave $260,000 in missions work last year. 
pushing. We want the gospel to go forward. We want the gospel to go forward. We want the gospel to go forward. We want it to go forward all over the world where it isn't yet. We want it to go forward. We want this to be house of prayer for all nations. But can I bring it home for just a second? Because you know what's easy? Sending money. Oh, it's so easy. You know how you do it? Well, you don't even get your checkbook out anymore. Who's got one of those? You get your phone out and you go. Send. God, look at what I did. I believe in sending the gospel to the nations. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if we become exclusive in Hedgesville, I told you I wanted to bring it local for a second. It's easy for me to send money to people I don't know and will never speak to. It's different for me to create a space in here for people I don't like. (laughs) Hmm. I got your attention now. You're like, they came with me this morning. (laughs) I can can write the check. I can get online, make the donation. I can even sign up for a mission trip because I know it's a week. And I'm going to get there and get back. Come on, somebody say amen. But Jesus was flipping it over because he's saying, I have brought the nations to you. Come on, I've brought different people to you and created a space for worship with you. I've brought people to you. Now, I know you don't like them, but that doesn't give you the right to take their space and turn it into a supermarket. So what the church has to wake up to is this is not a, just a club that everybody that's the same gets to be a part of. No, God is saying, listen, the people that you may not inherently like or may rub you the wrong way or may be different than us. Listen, in every church, he's created a space for those people. And he's not saying just give them the space and ignore them. Show them how to worship. Show them how to worship. Show them how to worship. Come on, come on. They're, they're, in, they're in the temple courts. Come on, show them what this looks like. Show them, show them how it happens. Come on, come on, get it together, church. Now this last thing, watch this. Now this is starting to make sense. Can, I, can, we, can we agree? The fig tree had leaves, but no potential fruit. It didn't have a little berry on it that would fall off. And Jesus said, there's no potential here, so I'm gonna curse the tree. And then he goes into the temple, seeing no potential, flips over the tables. This thing's got leaves on it, but nothing is happening. You've taken all the potential away. Now he walks back out. And the description he gives when Peter says, hey, man, that thing's withered all the way to the bottom. That was fast. Jesus teaches them something. And if we're not careful, we go, that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. He starts talking about, hey, look up at the Mount of Olives. If you want to throw that mountain into the sea, you just ask and it'll be done. Well, I can tell you there will be no mountains anywhere if that prayer was accurate. Because I would be like, Lord, in the name of Jesus, make it all flat. I'm driving to Florida. I'm driving up up north. It'd be nice not to have to go up the mountain. Wouldn't it be nice not to have to drive over the mountain back here in the winter? It's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying, have faith in the prayer. He was saying, the first step to fruit, disciples, listen to me. The first step to fruit is to have the faith in God. To believe nothing is impossible. Believe nothing is impossible. Have faith. Real fruit comes from real faith. Look at your neighbor and say, real fruit comes from real faith. Real fruit comes from real faith. We know you can't pray about anything you want and just get it. God's not a doesn't operate a candy store. It's to indicate that if we ask according to his will, how do we know that? Because we are focused on the will of God. Remember, go back to the way we were supposed to be worshiping in the temple. He's making a correlation. 
The, my will was not happening in the temple. And I'm telling you, when we come out here and look at this, I want you to know if you pray according to my will, nothing is impossible. But when you go into the temple and act like that and you don't do it the way I ask you, you won't get it. You won't get it. Fruit comes from faith in the will of God, not faith that I'm praying the right prayer. That's where we get this thing mixed up. We're going, God, I'm praying, I'm praying, and you're not answering. And he's saying, I need you to have faith in me and my will in your life, and that's when fruit will start showing up. But the, but the Jewish leaders did the exact opposite. He said, I need your faith to be in me, and you'll produce fruit. And they said, we don't want you in here. We want you to do what we want you to do. And then the last thing he says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Now it's starting to make sense a little bit, isn't it? If you have anything against anyone, they had just, they had turned the worship space for Gentiles into a supermarket. And he's like, you can't worship as long as you're taking advantage of other people. You can't do it. You can't do it. So stand to your feet. We're going to try it. Real fruit is produced because we love the Lord our God with everything we have and love our neighbors as ourselves. And Jesus walked in the temple and saw neither of those things happening. Neither of those things happening. So we got a decision to make. How are we going to respond when he points it out? Are we going to respond like the Jewish leaders and say, just get out of here. We're going to try to figure out how to ruin you. Or we're going to say, God, you spoke to me today. I need to... I need to put my faith in your will for my life and I need to forgive those around me. And Lord, when you put your finger on it, I'll repent and I'll turn towards you. That's when fruit starts to bear in your life. That's when your life starts to produce things. And we have that opportunity this morning. Come on, can you lift your hands and let's pray like that together. Lord, you put your finger on me this morning. God, that I'm walking around with leaves but Lord, it doesn't look like there's any potential. And I need you to forgive me first. I need you to forgive me, Lord. I repent today and I turn towards you. Lord, I forgive those around me who've offended me. I forgive, Lord, and I need your forgiveness. Come on, tell him you trust him this morning. Whatever he's putting his finger on, tell him you trust him. Lord, we want to bear fruit today. We don't just want to be a tree with leaves. We want to bear fruit. We thank you for this opportunity to get it right. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.